we're excited to have another empowered patient, an empowered patient who's also very digitally savvy. Please help me in giving a warm welcome to Charlie Kimball. Thanks, Kevin. OK, so take me back. It's 2007. You're racing well. You're in Europe. And what happened? Well, I was starting to make mistakes. Um, and I, it was a new series, and the World Series by Renault. They're pretty quick cars. I think we saw nearly 190 miles an hour at the first race. And I was getting better and better, because it was my first year of still learning. And then after racing in Monaco in May, I kind of hit a figurative wall. Um, and I use that wording very carefully, because <laughs> I didn't actually hit a wall. But, um, I, I stopped progressing, and one of the things that, you know, looking back, my, the diabetes was starting to, to affect me and affect my mental capacity and the clarity of mind, and, and racing is a very mental sport. Yes, it's physical, yes, it's hard work, but it takes a lot of concentration to do the exact same thing lap to lap to lap, but, you know, over 150 mile an hour average. So I was really struggling. And I went to the doctor with a skin rash to try and get some cream or something to clear it up. And from there, he asked me if there was anything else going on in my health. And I said, I've, I've been a little thirsty. Mm -hmm. and, and he was kind of writing notes and had his head down, just sort of finishing up the visit. And, and he stopped and his head snapped up. And he said, how thirsty is a little thirsty? And I said, oh, you know, four, five, six bottles of water a night and kind of mm. having to go to the bathroom a lot. And he, um, he said, OK, have you lost any weight? And I went, of course I have. And, and he went, sorry? And I was in England at the time. And I said, well, I've been training a lot. And so I've been doing a good job with my nutrition, trying to stay lean. And I think I've lost a couple of pounds. And he had me jump on a scale. And I'd lost 25 pounds in a week. Well, oh, geez. Um, and at that point, when I saw the number on the scale, I went, oh, OK, maybe there is something going on. Um, and that started, pardon the pun, but the road to recovery. Right, right. Now, you're in, you're in England at the time, is that right, when you got the di diagnosis? When you were actually with the doctor, did, were you with a friend? Did you have any family members, or were you there alone? Um, I was pretty much there alone, because I, I was sharing a house with my sister, who was working over there as well. But she was off in Brazil working. And um, I was supposed to be leaving the next morning for Portugal for a race. So luckily, my dad was arriving that afternoon um, from Los Angeles, where I'm from. And so. I spent, after that morning appointment, I spent all day reading horror stories online um, <laughs> and, and hearing about all these people who've lost legs and, and horrible right. situations. And so then I picked him up from the bus station, and we, uh, we went to dinner across the street and sat down and said, Dad, I went to the doctor, and it, he thinks I have diabetes and burst into tears. And yeah. um, so initially I was alone, but as soon as I got over that, burying my head in the sand and, and had that support system in place, um, I was overwhelmed by the community, the diabetes care community, the, the outreach. When I had to put a press release out saying I couldn't race that weekend because of the diagnosis, I got emails from people all over the world. I mean, there was a guy in Holland, a guy in Texas, a guy in China, basically lending their support and saying, yep, yeah, all right, that's not great news. but..." You know, if you don't bury your head in the sand, if you deal with it, if you manage, if you sort of apply the same discipline you have as a racing driver to your diabetes management, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to get back in the race car and be back in victory lane. And, and what was the key moment for that? Was it hearing messages from others that saying, yes, you will be able to continue racing? Or who, who told you in a way that convinced you that, OK, I'm going to be able to figure this out? Um, I think. It was mainly the, the day after diagnosis, I went and saw an endocrinologist in, in Oxford. Um, and it was at the Churchill Hospital. And the, they have a specific diabetes and endocrinology wing. Um, and it was really light, airy, nice, sort of not the typical British hospital red brick, you know, right. kind of dark, cold. Um, and the endocrinologist came in. And I said, OK, before you go too far, doc, I'm a professional racing driver. You know, am I going to be able to get back in the car? And, and there are those moments in your life where you, have the, you know you have to ask the hard question. Yeah. 
and it, it's that the sports slow motion instant replay, like someone's hit pause as the guy's diving for the, right. the goal line. It was, it seemed like hours, days even, and it was probably a couple of seconds and he finished writing something, he looked up and he went, well, yeah, I don't see any reason why not. You know, they're world-class athletes doing amazing things with diabetes. He referenced Sir Stephen Redgrave, a British Olympic rower, um, Gary Hall Jr., the swimmer. He talked about mountain climbers and ballerinas and, and just all sorts of broad spectrum of people doing amazing things athletically with diabetes. And he said, I don't see why driving a race car should be any different. He said, now, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but you, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to. That's great. That must have been a feeling of relief when you heard that. It, my world stopped spinning out of control at that point, and, and at least at, then I had a path to walk towards getting healthy and getting back in the race car, which, as far as I con was concerned, was more important than being healthy. Mm. <laughs> now, what have you had to do? So you're back in the race car. How, have you, how are you managing your sugars and everything? Um, well, I use you know, two types of insulin, and I use injection pens um, to manage it. When I'm at the racetrack, I wear a continuous glucose monitor. I actually Velcro it to my steering wheel. Um, real high-tech adhesive methodology. Um, <laughs> it gives me a chance, though, to keep an eye on my sugar levels while I'm racing. And if, because of the exercise portion and the mental focus, if I'm burning off more glucose than I'm expecting or the numbers are falling more quickly than I'd planned on, uh, in my helmet, I have a drinks tube that hooks up to a drinks bottle that I have orange juice in. So you just rig this up yourself, or this is just putting orange juice instead of water? Well, I had to rig it up myself because the, the junior level where I am, the races aren't really long enough to need hydration. Uh. But at the IndyCar level and NASCAR, sort of the longer 500-mile races, they do have drinks bottles with water in them. I've replaced that methodology with orange juice so I can drink my sugar if my blood sugar is lower than it should be. What I'm trying to do is put protocols and safety nets in place so that when I step up to the Indianapolis 500 and you know wrestling a car around the streets of Long Beach at 200 miles an hour, these things will allow me to focus on just the difference in cars and the added speed and the added physical exertion rather than having to worry about diabetes on top of that. 